Thank you for having me today. And um, um, I think the expectation has uh, reached a new top after all of the great talks today. So I have a great obligation and great honor to be the, the last talk. And yeah, spoiler alert, there's going to be some H3 and some grids in the, in the talk. Uh, but um, while we're talking about unification here, about raster and vector data, as you have probably seen through the, the rest of the day, uh, there are a lot of use cases that leverage vector data. There are a lot of use cases that focus on the raster data, but I think we get the most out of the both worlds when we, when we bring it together. And that opens up a lot of uh, also innovative technologies like AI and ML. But uh, full disclosure, there's not going to be any chat GPT in my presentation. So sorry if, if that's what the uh, holding you up uh, to watch this. But <clears throat> so I'm going to split this talk into two brief sections. So the first one is a, a bit of uh, how Databricks envisions the architecture of the cloud platforms and how the geospatial ecosystem fits in that few slides. And then we're going to see how that actually uh, enables unification, enables AI and ML, and uh, um, brings uh, capabilities for both of your experienced and very hands-on uh, individuals, but also to citizen individuals who are not necessarily well versed with AI, but they have domain knowledge and want to model uh, something like hazard risk. And for the ones of you that attended the workshop last uh, yesterday, it's going to be a lot of repetition. But uh, for the ones that haven't, I hope there's going to be uh, quite a bit of new content here. So why are we talking about geospatial? Because it's everywhere. Um, and uh, I think this is just a a slide to remind how quickly the complexity uh, uh, enters into this domain. You know, we usually enter the GIS by seeing the, well, my first use case was here's some Excel data, here's some uh, locations where uh, branches are in a bank, and then all of a sudden I needed to bring in postcodes, oh, here are vectors, and then in some cases you need to bring in uh, um, uh, climate data because you are now quantifying risk of your physical assets. It gets there very quickly, and then all of a sudden it's 3D. So, uh, from that perspective, what we are aiming to do with the lake house, and for the ones that haven't used Databricks or are not familiar with us, we, we have coined this concept of the lake house platform as a platform that brings the best of the two worlds, the data lakes uh, that were promising scalability and structure and unstructured and semi-structured data processing, um, something that can hold up and uh, enable processing petabyte scale. On the other hand, warehouses that have been with us for decades, and they've been focusing on very structured use cases, very, uh, the, the use cases are very important. They actually go up to the decision makers in the business, but they, they, they have a, a, a different rigor, and uh, they're much more structured. So when you bring both, you actually have that scalability, but the rigor and the, and the structure that you have in the warehouses. All of those concepts are very relevant to any type of data, including GIS data. And this is where we think uh, we can bring a lot of value specifically through vector and raster unification. Um, so, and why are we talking so much about lake houses? Can you just you know, live with a data warehouse? Yes, if you are focusing on historic thing and retrospective. So if all you want to do is think about the past, you're probably OK staying there. But when, the moment you want to go into forecast, in um, predicting data that isn't there, and doing that at the scale, um, on a country level or on a, on a continent level, you may need to go on that maturity curve. And a lot of what um, Javier was talking in the, in the first keynote was about you know, accelerating towards that upper corner and uh, getting into that automated decision making uh, abstraction of complexity and, and getting uh, AI to be used for, uh, for the good uh, in this case. So historically in many systems, we had that disconnect. So you'll prepare a lot of your historical view in one part of your platform, and then you'll start doing that advanced use cases in another part of the platform that introduces organic silos. And it's very hard to even exchange data internally, let alone with your partners in uh, and such. So again, this is why we're trying to bring those capabilities into a unified platform. So you have unified platform and then unified formats. And it's all about that uh, integration. And uh, this is where I, I stop with the Lake House platform, so I promise next slide is, is actually geospatial things. Um, the, the platform itself is just uh, centered around three main principles. It's uh, simple, so it needs to be obvious how to use. It needs to be open, so you're not locked in in the platform. It's built on open source technologies, so um, it, it allows you to integrate with other parts of your sick, uh, ecosystem, but also move away if you need to. And multi-cloud, so same as it can't be a feature lock-in, it can't be a platform lock-in either. 
Now, going to a use case. So with this platform and with this power at our hands, what we can do. So very um, happy uh, topic for the end of the day, right? Hazards. Uh, but um, I think a lot of businesses these days are very focused around risk. It comes in many shapes and forms. Um, and it comes both in commercial uh, and uh, public sector. It's, um, it, it's quite interesting that, for instance, flood risk model that you can use for um, assessing the risk of your physical assets, like when you're doing your uh, insurance premiums, could also be potentially used in defense because roads and railways are critical infrastructure. They can't be at risk. Certain uh, routes are evacuation routes. They can't be at risk. So you actually need to quantify that in those domains as well. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about this type of use cases is the variety of the data that enters into the use case itself. So if we go to the first slide that I showed, Geospatial data is everywhere. All types of that geospatial data will find its way into the, a type of a use case like this. Um, um, and from that perspective, that might be raster data coming as a climate um, um, uh, variables, uh, precipitation, uh, sun exposure, uh, soil information, etc. It could be then the physical assets. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to focus on the risk of flooding for the roads, which is not very common in, in many cases, but it can then feed into your uh, emergency response type of modeling, uh, rapid rerouting, um, or in, uh, um, in, in many other use cases. So our approach in this case is to get all of our raster layers, find, find a way to get it in H3, and we'll show how that works in, in the platform, but do the same also for the vector data. And now when we have um, both the raster and vector in the same domain, the domain itself is the unification. So uh, if you can project your rasters into H3 grid, and if you can project your vectors into H3 grid, well, that's the same system. So now it's just a, a quality join, and I, I believe we, we, we have heard about that in some of the previous talks, like how equi joins on, a, on an H3 ID are much more performant than trying to do a simple ST intersects or a ST contains. Now, once we get it there, this becomes a very, um, nice data set because it has an ID, it has a measurement, and it has a bunch of those. Now, we can feed that into an ML model because we will have some variable being a target, in this case, flood risk, uh, or the ponding duration, or the area of ponding. And the other numerical variables that we extract will be our features. And in our platform, we have this capability called AutoML that allows you to point into a data set and press a play button, and we'll run hundreds of machine learning models and return you the best performing one with respect to the problem that you have, uh, whether that's a regression or classification, even forecast. And, and then we can serve it in the platform very easily without you actually knowing how to build a model from scratch. But if you do know how to build it from scratch and fine tune it, you have access to it, you have access to the code that we use to generate it, and you can continue that process and iterate further. So. Um, one of the things that will enable us to do this um, um, is the, the concept of geospatial feature store. Now, we are in this H3 uh, domain, and just bear in mind, I'm, I'm talking here in a very generic sense, H3 could be replaced by British National Grid, by a quad binning, by a custom grid. The point is just having that grid as a unified thing for everything you do. But the geospatial feature store, how it works, you'll have two components. One is your location key, which is really good because H3 has a unique key. So anything that falls within a unique H3 cell is uniquely identifiable and a timestamp. So you can actually build time series against those H3 cells. Uh, you define the, the level of fidelity by choosing the, the resolution, but that's, um, that's a concept. Because H3 uh, as a grid has a lot of other concepts, you can now uh, build features using uh, K rings, uh, using traversals of logical features like get me all of the features alongside the river or alongside the road. Um, and then ensure rep uh, reproducibility, so any anytime you build another model, those features are accessible. And just a little bit on that. So the feature registry step is when I'm building the features, independently of anybody else, completely asynchronously, and I register them against the feature store. Uh, feature provider is when later this month, I come back and I ask, give me all of the features for this cell. Anything I or somebody else, uh, with respect to the, obviously, policy for data access has built, and I can start modeling. So somebody completely independently of me may have built new features for the location that I'm interested for, and I get access for it because I have a central, central way to look up. Them. Um, 
and how that works in an AutoML. So I have a, uh, a UI. Uh, basically, I will configure a compute. Uh, that's one click. Uh, then I will uh, browse my data sets. So that's a second click. I will then maybe need to click 20 to 30 times to select the features, but that's up to the number of features I don't want to use, and say what's my target. And what I will end up with is uh, a, uh, an experiment that contains all of the metadata of all of the, the models that I've run with their performance. I can sort, browse, get the best one and uh, exploration of my data, so how the features were automatically generated. If I'm interested in that level of detail, if I'm not, I will then just consume the model. So it's easy to deploy because it's already pre-registered pre and it's a, it's a part of a managed service. And it's very easy to understand and debug and get the data quality because everything is captured. So it's kind of like a opposite thing of a black box approach, which we call a glass box approach. And we can iterate further because we get access to the code and the models. Uh, so it, it supports uh, beyond that, we, if you have uh, very advanced uh, practitioners, you can take that base model. And now you want to go further, you always want to compare against that base model. Anything you do further needs to be better, otherwise you're just wasting your time. So you can then point more advanced resources in your organization to use deep learning, chat GPT if you think that would help with flood risk, I don't know, but uh, and iterate further and further and make the system better. Uh, so, Two concepts that allow us to then build this hazard risk model is the vector tiles and a framework called Mosaic that's uh, uh, Databricks Labs. Uh, we have uh, this concept of labs and we have a, 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 an area of projects that have been sourced by our industry practitioners and then opened up for, for our customers. So vector tiles allow us a duality. We can present vectors as a discrete grid or go back to the pieces uh, of the, the, the vectors that fall within a unique cell. So it allows us to have exact um, ST operations if we need to, or have grid-based approximates if we need to. Um, and the, the other concept, I have a, an error here, it should say raster tiles, so sorry about that. I guess uh, expected at the end of the day. But uh, so it's the same principle, just with the raster data. So we will tile our rasters with respect to the H3. We'll maintain those pixels within an H3 cell we can expose those as an area of value, so you can apply a mathematical model if you need to, or we can summarize those for you in, a, in one step and generate your grid. So what you see down is an interpolated grid of uh, precipitation data uh, uh, in, the, um, in the states, uh, extracted from a net CDF with uh, as, as few as three lines of Python code. Now, if we borrow the previous concepts, we basically can join these things because we have a layer of uh, vectors that are all in H3 grids and we have layers of raster data that are all in H3 grids, so they are joinable on that unique ID. And we're gonna set up that AutoML ex uh, experiment. These are all the steps needed uh, for actually building a model. So select the compute, I'm repeating this, I know. Select the target, select the variables and press run. And uh, this is what we get. Uh, so we have started from, and. I'm just going to do a very bad practice, which is go a couple slides back, but sorry about that. So what you see on the bottom here is a uh, learning data that we have. It's very sparse. So it was covering only about 5% of the actual territory that we wanted to have a risk uh, uh, score for. And we built a model that's now a dense because uh, it can actually score the full territory of the United States or of a specific state, in this case, state of New York. Now you can then browse that model by checking for a specific uh, risk grade and select the road asset and basically the cells are the, 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 the lowest fidelity you can go with the, the risk grade. So if you needed a more fine grade risk, you would grid your data on a lower resolution, but you can then browse and see these are locations that are actually much more risky. Now, um, the, the, the big benefit of this is this is a model. If you have new innovative ways of defining features, you can take it and then further iterate and, and build more and more uh, advanced capabilities on top of that. And uh, that, that's pretty much where I, I wanted to leave with this talk is an end-to-end end -end journey, starting with some vector data, starting with some raster data, and then getting uh, a dense output to uh, a relatively diff difficult problem such as uh, flood risk and scale. And, <coughs> Last thought, I just want to say thank you to some other people that have contributed to uh, this collateral. It, it does really take a village to, to achieve something like this. But yeah, thank you all. And 
I am a couple of minutes over, apologies for that, but I um, hope I didn't take too long to uh, devote you from the drinks.